The recent Gran Turismo 7 debacle has already received a lot of attention from outlets more famous than myself. Nonetheless, I wanted to talk about it as well as I feel there's some extra insight I can give here as a fan of the franchise. That doesn't mean I'm going to go soft on it though, as I need to roast Kazunori Yamauchi for this statement. It's just not acceptable. The first thing he talks about is the server downtime, which I actually think is the bigger issue here. A lot of players were angry not so much because of the microtransactions, but because they couldn't play the game at all. Immediately before the release of the pair 1.07 update, he says, we discovered an issue where the game would not start properly in some cases. This was a rare issue, and I have to stop here. Because if they're saying it was a rare issue, it was only affecting some users, which means it wasn't affecting most issues. But their apparent solution was to that was to take the servers down and leave them down for 30 hours more than planned. So that 30 hour downtime affected all users as opposed to some users. That clearly wasn't the play. They, they could have done literally anything else. They could have rolled it back to version 1.06 or they could have just left version 1.07 out there, let most users still play the game and then come here, came out with the emergency patch. And the reason why this is such a problem is when the game is offline, it's almost literally unplayable. You can go to the World Circuits Pavilion, but when you go there, all you've got is single race, time trial, and drift trial. And I'm using screenshots from Zocker's stream here. I hope he doesn't mind, but the single race option doesn't even let you tweak the settings like in custom race. Why does custom race need an online connection? And you can't use your garage either. You've got 13 rental cars to choose from. The only other game mode available is the music rally and well, there's only six music rallies, so it's not a great deal of content. All in all, Gran Turismo 7, when it's not connected to the servers, is basically just a demo version of itself. And that's not acceptable to be left with a demo version of a game that you own the full version of. But even if I do want to stress that a maintenance period of 32 hours and 45 minutes is unacceptable in any context, I am going to spend a disproportionate amount of time talking about Gran Turismo 7's game economy. Going in, I think a lot of fans of the series knew there was going to be an early game grind because that's just how Gran Turismo is. So the microtransactions came across as being superfluous, especially at the exchange rate that was being offered. But then in this update, a lot of the late game grinding methods got chopped down and I've, I'll show you the uh, numbers right now. Some of these nerfs are extremely petty, especially the American races down the bottom. Who was even grinding the FR challenge? There were better grinding methods even later on in the menu book campaign. Kazanori says, I want to make GT7 a game in which you can enjoy a variety of cars lots of different ways and if possible would like to try to avoid a situation where a player must mechanically keep replaying certain events over and over again. Does Kazunori even understand his own franchise? At the start of the game we were led to believe that the era of the 20 million credit car was over. The most expensive car at launch was 4.6 million credits because everyone had the same used car and legend car dealership. But then pretty quickly, a Jaguar for 12 million was introduced, and now we've got this McLaren F1 at 18.5 million credits. I'm like, bruh. This is from DDM, as was the uh, previous screenshot that I switched to. They've actually gone ahead and shown you how exactly how many hours you'd have to grind, even with optimal play, to afford the McLaren, and, and that's constant gameplay. That's not even countering, countering the breaks you'd need to take for life and sleep. But the reason why I question whether or not Kazunori even understands his own game franchise is because mid to late game credit grinding methods have been a fairly common mainstay in the Gran Turismo series, and I find it rude that he's implying that Grinding the same event over and over again just because you want to earn certain cars faster is an invalid way to play the game. Which brings me to the meat of the video. 
So what I'm going to do is assess credit economies and grinding methods from throughout the Gran Turismo series, starting with the first game where I think the best thing you could do is buy one of the Dodge Vipers, probably this one because it's cheaper, and then because it's so much better than any other car in stock trim in this game, you'd enter the normal car competition. If you clean, clean swept everything, you'd get up to 400,000 credits, including the pole position bonus. Hey, <laughs> hey, you said pee pee. And then after a couple of rounds of that, you could afford any car in the game easily because the most expensive models, including the famous Castrol Super GT, only 500,000 credits. Gran Turismo 2 introduced more expensive cars compared to the first game. Most famously the, the Pikes Peak Escudo, which is 2 million credits, tied for most expensive car in the game. However, Gran Turismo 2 also had even better grinding methods because you would receive prize cars per race win as opposed to championship like in the rest of the series. and. You needed a good car to do this, but what you could do is run Red Rock Valley, race 3 of the All-Star Series, 50,000 for the race win, and a speed 12 that you could sell for 500,000 credits a pop. Gran Turismo 3 is somewhat of an outlier in that there's no easy way to farm credits in this game. You've got to remember that the professional league races in this game were all 10 laps minimum. And the most expensive car that you can actually buy is still 2 million credits, the Esperante. But the unique thing about Gran Turismo 3 is that a lot of the best cars in the game could not be bought. And because there were so many events for you to do... By the end of the game, you owned most of the cars anyway, just from prize cars, without having to spend a single credit on actual car purchases. On paper, Gran Turismo 4 was also fairly stingy with credits, and there were some really expensive cars to buy in this game, is such as the Le Mans races, which would cost you 4.5 million credits. However, there was a new feature added to this game too, where you could clear your trophy data in a series and then redo the series again. So the famous credit riding road method is to do the Capri Rally, win the Toyota Raid car after winning two events, then you clear your gold trophies and you do those races again, you get another Raid car and you start selling your extra Raid cars, you end up with a lot of credits in a hurry. In summation, easy money tricks in the mid to late game are a common feature in Gran Turismo games, and the closest GT7's economy gets to a classic game is GT3. Even then, GT3 had much cheaper top end cars and more prize cars to win, because even though GT7 offers a lot of prize cars, 3 had more still, and more valuable ones at that. In other words, I don't think this statement from Kaz solves anything, and I just want to say, Kaz, blink twice if Sony is holding your daughter hostage, because I really don't want to think that this is Follow Fanny Digital's fault, but you're not giving me a lot to work with here.